And that is our good friend, Lisa Dietland. She is the president and CEO of the Institute of Transformational Philanthropy. Hi, Lisa. So good to see you. Hey, Amy. Happy New Year. Belated. Happy. Or- you know, I feel like this year, I've seen some people say this. It didn't even start till February 1st. Okay, good. Then <laughs> so, Happy New Year. <laughs> so we're just getting going here. So it's all good. Well, you do so much wonderful work um, oh, through your you. organization. And you've always given us such really great practical solutions to be a little more engaged and, right. and do so thoughtfully and, and well. And so we've talked about in, in years past about making a charitable plan and things like that. But what, what is really, uh, what, what is kind of up on your radar this year on the topic of philanthropy? Don't forget what happened in 2017. You know, um, 2017 was a year of disasters. And whether you think about the Las Vegas shooting, or you think about the hurricanes that hit, or you think about the flooding in California, or the fires, or what have you, you know, it's really the year 2018 is don't forget. I mean, we don't need something shiny and new. We have a lot of things that we have not yet solved, taken care of, that are still in recovery. And reaching back and helping those individuals, um, I was reminded, I was sharing with you that I was in Tucson a couple weeks ago, and one of the women that was at this um, party that I was at shared that it was actually her nephew's wife that was the woman that was shot in the head that was just released from the hospital, and they had just learned that she was going to be able to walk, but here it is, and I thought, oh my gosh, I forgot about Vegas. Mm -hmm. I forgot about the Vegas shooting, and her family was dealing with it because they were so happy she was finally coming home, Sure, but yet we're... We've We're moved on to next- three other disasters. Absolutely. Yeah. Or what can I do? So yeah. it's really important to me that in 2018, we remember what happened in 2017 and that we make sure that we've shored that all up. That is very good advice. And so I want to get, I want to touch on that, that charitable plan of action yeah. because that's something you talk about a lot. And I think it's so good because it really makes it feel very doable to kind of sit down at the beginning of the year and really just kind of think about what your plan is, which I think is valuable even if you just have, you know, limited time and money to, but right. you want to do something. Right. And most of us do have limited time and money. Um, even those of us who are um, ultra wealthy um, will come to me and say, my, my time and even even my resources are limited. So two things I always recommend. One is make a charitable plan of action, but also two, don't be so rigid that you don't have that little bit of extra room, both time-wise and money-wise, for those unanticipated asks. So what do I mean by a charitable plan of action? Think about, do a couple things. Sit down, maybe this weekend, next weekend, maybe while you're getting more ready for the Super Bowl tomorrow, and think about what did you give to last year? What was really important to you? Some of us, it was about the hurricane. Some of us, it was about the shootings or the floods or the fires or what have you. Some of us, maybe our favorite aunt got breast cancer or we adopted and rescued a pet from a disaster. And all of a sudden, animals and taking care of animals. One of my friends, Colleen, did that. You know, she started taking... um, classes or courses at PAWS in order to better take care of animals. And, you know, she got pulled right into that. She works a lot and travels a lot and couldn't take care of an animal on her own, but she can definitely volunteer. And that became part of um, her commitment in 2017. So think about what you did in in 2017. Um, What did you care about? And then think about what are you really passionate about? Do you like to hike, walk, build things with your hands, take care of animals, interact with seniors, interact with children? What do you really like to do? And then think about maybe what came on your radar new that maybe you have Puerto Rican relatives, maybe you're from Puerto Rico and you really want to make sure that the recovery, the recovery phase that they're in happens. And then what do you have to spend in terms of money and time? And if it's, you know, $100 a month, do you want to give $100 to one organization or 25 to four? You know my thought is give more to fewer, Mm -hmm. um, but that's not everybody's cup of tea. And then also think about your time. Our time is our most precious commodity. Most people think it's money, but it really is our time. And I was shocked in getting ready for the show. I always like to, you know, get the numbers together. And I learned that we're still only at 25% of Americans volunteering. That means 75% of us aren't getting off the couch and volunteering there's more that we can do. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was redoing some reading on that very topic yeah. a little bit and, and, and even talking with, with uh, esteemed producer Tom Hush on this very topic about how do we troubleshoot? The, I think sometimes people are overwhelmed with this <sighs> sense of apathy of like, well, there's nothing I can do that's going to make a difference. Right. How do we address that? How do we 
troubleshoot it and kind of change the narrative there? Well, I think, first of all, realize that you can make a difference. And you you know, I've said in the past, it can be as easy as a smile, paying for somebody's coffee in line, letting somebody cut in front of you in a, in a car merging situation, putting money in a meter for somebody. It can be that simple. Every one of us can do something. And it doesn't have to be a big, gigantic, I'm going to undertake this this um, arduous task. But I also think get your friends and family involved. I just learned from one of my friends, Dana, that her youngest son with his friends once a month make a meal for um, Ronald McDonald houses. Isn't that nice? And I'm like, oh my gosh. And she's so proud of them. And they're learning to cook. And because they're all in it together, you know, it's like exercise. You know, if you have a sure. buddy that shows up at your front door, you're going walking. Yeah, you if can't buddy, <laughs> If the buddy doesn't show up, you're like, oh, let me hit that snooze again. Yeah. Let me roll over. So I think, you know, get some friends together. I have a friend in Vegas um, that I do see often on Facebook posting, you know, with she and her sister and others, that they're cooking at some sort of um, pantry or soup kitchen. And they do it once a month. So get your family and friends involved. Make that commitment. You know, the one thing that our parents always say to us is, I'd love to spend more time with you. Why not get mom and say, you know, once a month, instead of just going to eat or going to a movie or, you know, trying to figure out shopping or what we're going to do, we're going to go volunteer. And I'm going to pick it this month and you pick it next month. And actually have that apathy not be even relevant to the conversation. Yeah, I, I like that a, a lot. I also like your point about looking back at where you gave because I think sometimes that can be a blur, especially when we have disasters. Right. You have to kind of look back and go, okay, what did happen? Where did I give? What <laughs> happened? Um, and because sometimes it's it's when it's an immediate response. Right. And it's go, overwhelming. Right. Well, if you remember, you know, uh, Harvey and Irma had, and then we had um, the um, relief for Harvey, you know, when we had all of the, the, the telethon, and then Irma had come ashore. You know, and all of a sudden you have um, other folks, Mark Anthony and um, Jennifer Lopez and Alex Rodriguez heading up that for the, the Caribbean. And then all of a sudden you're hearing about the fires in California and then the mudslide. Then, then uh, Hurricane Maria comes yeah. in and then Nate and it just keeps going. Oh my going. gosh, it just keeps going and going. And you can't get, you know, we're setting right now disaster fatigue. You know, how much, where's that tipping point where people are like, oh my gosh, I don't have another $25 I can give. Yeah. I don't have another hundred dollars I can give. It is so overwhelming, the enormity, uh, and it just doesn't stop. Yeah. I think too, sometimes it seems hard to figure out, especially say a moment of a disaster, there's so many organizations responding. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes it's very difficult to say, do you, I think that's another word, do I want to give $10 to three places or $30 to one place when you want to be impactful? But then also you want to know how your money's being used. Correct. And we're living in an era where transparency is so critical to donors. Um, it used to be they just trusted the brand. If it was the American Red Cross or the Salvation Army or Habitat for Humanity, well, they must be doing good. And of course, over the years, we've seen scandals that happen with those nonprofit organizations that perhaps had leadership that wasn't following the rules or as ethical as we would have hoped they would have been, or maybe they had a different plan. Um, American Red Cross has come under fire because at times they hold money back. If you understand their plan, which is, yes, we need immediate relief, but that's not the only relief. There's, you know, the rescue, the, the, the rescue, the relief, and then the recovery. Rescue, get you out of harm's way. Relief, make sure you've got food, clothing, and shelter. And then there's a the recovery long term. But people just see the immediate need. And so the strategy's good, but the communication was bad, and so they take a hit for that. Um, I think you gotta look now in these days whether you want a macro viewpoint, nonprofit, or a micro. Macro or micro. Obviously, the big guns, you know, the ones that I've just named, as well as a host of others, oftentimes take a macro approach that they're at the top leadership level and they're helping at the big level. What we saw with these disasters in the fall and during hurricane season is many people wanted to go micro. They wanted mm -hmm. to go and know that that medical van got into that community, that that school got fixed, that that house got repaired, that that coffee shop you know was open to serve the first responders. They wanted to go micro. So I think that's one thing our listeners could think about when you're thinking about giving. Is it a macro approach? You know that. Gosh, I trust. I know I don't know enough about disaster relief. Or 
and recovery and what is Lisa talking about? But I know the American Red Cross does and I know the Salvation Army does and I know United Way does. Or is it like, gosh, you know, I came from this little town in California and I saw that it caught on fire and 60% of the residents had to leave and I care about that community. So I'm going to search and find out what fund has been set up to help those residents. I want to shift a little bit when we think about the act of volunteering and, and, and doing charitable acts and, and giving money or time or whatever. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of how to overcome the apathy or right. the, oh, I could never make a difference. It's too <laughs> big a problem. Um, but what do you think it is that that gets people moving and, and like what is that call like how do you you know what I mean that, that makes someone go I'm, I need to do this I need to be involved <laughs> I need to write a check or give some time or give whatever well you know there's actually been scientific studies done that show there's like these endorphins that get released and you get this high you know that there's actually a high whether it's making a financial donation or volunteering your time that, that act of being selfless and helping somebody or something or an animal or cleaning up a river or restoring a museum or a temple or a house or building a house or whatever that is, actually getting out of your own way and doing something for others has really lifelong lasting benefits, including better health. I mean, people don't believe it, but when you volunteer, um, studies have been done that volunteers have better health. They live longer. They have less depression. And Adam Grant is this professor um, out in Pennsylvania, and he wrote this book, give or take. And it was a study of, in return, do givers, takers, or matchers get more out of life? Meaning, if I give unconditionally, what do I get in return? Or if I'm a taker, you know, we all have those people that we avoid like pariah at parties. (laughs) Or those matchers, like, I'll do this if you do that for Uh me. And the research shows that givers, givers get back, you know, tenfold. You know, if you believe in um, any of the sayings, you know, I think about Christianity and the Bible and they say, you know, if you, you reap what you sow, you get it back tenfold. It's really true. And it starts with volunteering, getting out of your own way and helping someone else. Yeah, which is not to say like being a martyr about it. I think it has to no, come from the right place. Absolutely. You know, I was going to meet some friends for breakfast a couple of weeks ago and it was one of those really cold, bitter mornings. So it's a Saturday and I was going to down the alley behind my house and there's this young man coming out of the gate, you know, into the alley to walk. And obviously he was going to the L. I live about four blocks from the L. And I got to the corner and I turned and I thought, Lisa Dietland, it is so freaking cold out. <laughs> Put the Jeep in reverse and I backed up and, and my mother would be terrified that I did this. And I said, hi. I said to this guy, I got over. I said, do you, do you want a ride? He goes, oh my God, it's so cold. So he hops in my Jeep. You know, most people, listeners are probably panicked, but in right. Chicago, we are a big, small town. And um, I said, you're going to the alley. He goes, yeah, oh my God, that would be so great. It's so cold out. And I go, and he was bundled up well. And I said, yes. And Found out he's from Michigan. I'm from Michigan. We had this great conversation. It was four blocks long. But, you know, when I dropped him off, I was in such a good mood because I had done something. I didn't expect to do it. It wasn't being a martyr. It was truly sharing. I've got a warm car. You're walking. It's cold. You know, and I don't recommend it to everybody. Right. Listeners, but I could see this breaking badly for some people. <laughs> but the point is... Um, it made me in a really good mood that morning as I went to my breakfast with my friends. Sure, sure. Well, yeah. there's a um, there's some research that you've brought to my attention about the health benefits of volunteering. There's also some that Harvard has done that really the, these studies match so wonderfully, yes. and it's really all about um, these positive health benefits that I don't think we know much about that are that are really interesting about lowering blood pressure, helping to kind of not necessarily cure, but certainly take the edge off of uh, like cyclical depression, things like that. That were that were throughout these studies that are really fascinating. It is fascinating. And I think we discount that um, that effect of volunteering, of neighbor helping neighbor, person helping stranger, friend helping friend. I mean, so, you know, people say to me all the time, how can I help? What can I do? And I say, it doesn't have to be with a stranger, like the example I just gave. One of my friends goes and sits with her friend who is having chemo treatment. She just sits there. And sometimes she reads to her out of a book she's reading. Sometimes they play cards. Sometimes they watch television. But she just goes and sits with her. Yeah, That's volunteering. That's helping. And she knows her. It's not a stranger. Um, you know, I had a, I have a really good friend who, when she lived here, would go to Northwestern Hospital and was trained and would hold the babies, the babies that were in the NICU. She loves babies. 
that just fed her soul. When you would see Liz after her session in the hospital, it would be amazing. There are benefits and benefits that we don't even yet know about that help us to be a better person by volunteering. I have written about this in many of my books and articles about the fact that when you volunteer, you don't know what's going to happen, who you're mm-hmm. going to meet, what's going to happen. Um, you know, Suling Jin, who was um, you know the founder of Flying Food Fair and has since passed away, but I remember uh, meeting her and she told me the story. I said, "How did you ever come up with this idea of you know putting food on air, you know, pitching to the airlines? How did you ever come up with that?" She said, "Well, Lisa, when I started my company." Company, I was a caterer and I didn't have much money, but I always wanted to give back. So I started volunteering with nonprofits. And at this one nonprofit I volunteered, they sent me next to the CEO of United Airlines. And she just started talking to him. You know, she'd volunteered. They sat, you know, the seating at the gala sat her next to him. And next thing you know, her food is on United Airlines. Her company has a contract with them. And so, you know, there again, you reap what you sow. She was giving back. She didn't have any resources. She was a caterer and she pitched the idea. Doesn't hurt to ask. No. (laughs) Don't ask, don't get, right? For sure. And then, so let's shift a little to the economic um, value of volunteering, because I think that is a part that we think of philanthropy being, write the check, that is what it means, and the organization can use that. And I think a lot of organizations will say, you know, 75 cents of every dollar goes to the pets or whatever. Um, And we think of it in very stark terms, but is... Is the act of volunteering more measurable than we think it is economically? Yes. Actually, you know, there are organizations, the independent sector among them, that actually measure it. And now they say that every hour of volunteering, on average, is worth $23.56. So if you think about volunteering, you're actually giving a $23.56 gift to the organization. Obviously, if you have higher skills, like you're an attorney, an accountant, a graphic artist, artists, those numbers might skew higher, but on average, yeah, $23, $24 an hour. That's what your volunteer hour is worth. And for many of us, you know, if we volunteer four hours, that's $100 that we're actually giving to the organization in terms of our time. The average person in this country volunteers only about 36 hours a year. So that's three hours a month. $75 $75 though, $75 every month that you would be giving. Now, if I sat there and said to you, Amy, could you write a $1,000 check, which is about $83 a month, but could you write a $1,000 check? Most of us say, well, I don't know. I got other causes. My house of worship. I have this, I have that. But if I said to you, hey, how about you meet me the third Saturday of the month before your show? It's right across the street. We're going to volunteer. We're going to volunteer from four to seven. You'd be doing the same thing. Much easier to say yes to to that. Right. Much easier, much easier. So, Lisa, as we are counting down the hours to kick off for <laughs> Super Bowl tomorrow, there is an overlooked aspect of Super Bowl that is really fascinating that is connected to volunteering. Absolutely. It is one of the largest, if not the largest, volunteer activities in America. Most people don't realize that the Super Bowl has 10 thousand volunteers. It needs 10,000 volunteers. There are 10,000 volunteers right now in Minnesota, freezing, a little bit colder. Bless them. I hope they're bundled. (laughs) Um, That are volunteering to help the Super Bowl. And people say to me, wait, 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 what do you mean? And it's not volunteering in the stadium tomorrow. They don't get tickets, don't think of it. But it's volunteering for the 10 days leading up to any Super Bowl. What it's about is helping the host committee. Um, It's a huge economic boost to have Uh, the Super Bowl and you obviously want to make a good impression and in Minnesota this weekend they're expecting a million tourists a million people to come whether they're actually going into the stadium or watching it you know from the local downtown bars and pubs and party areas um, they need greeters they need people who can help those guests that are coming into Minnesota many of them for the first time get around and so there's some requirements but as you might suspect it's all closed off for uh, this Super Bowl, but you can sign up for Super Bowl 53, which is in Atlanta. So it'll be a little bit much warm- warmer <laughs> at the Mercedes-Benz Studio uh, Stadium, excuse me. Um, but it, the, it is an amazing opportunity to give back and to volunteer. Sounds like it. That's, and that's not a thing we think of. We think of volunteer being 
giving blood or responding to a disaster or something, but making people feel welcome and navigate safely and help. And getting people from the airport to the hotel or getting people from, you know, the hotel to the stadium or making sure questions are answered and making sure that you're assisting the host committee, as you might suspect, especially with a heightened state of awareness to any people who might be trying to disrupt um, the game tomorrow. You know, there's a lot of needs. There's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts and the host committee needs a lot of helping hands. So those of you who are football fans and want to be part of the action and in the midst of it, um, obviously there are requirements you have to do. Like for this year with the Minnesota Host Committee, you had to do three shifts. Each shift was six hours, but it's over a 10-day stretch. You had to be above 18 years of age. But you get the T-shirt, the polo, the, you know, the backpack, the jacket. You get all the paraphernalia, and it's a great bonding experience. Sure, and I imagine you feel quite official running around being like, <laughs> I'm with the Super Bowl, <laughs> but totally I, not an athlete right <laughs> <laughs> maybe you and i should try that for atlanta let's do it next year. we're okay, gonna do we're it. On it yeah okay. definitely atlanta i'm, okay. I'm not about <laughs> we're being not outside going to, for, we're not for the going twin to cities Minnesota. so um as we are unfortunately counting down the clock here we're starting to run out of time already but what are some things that people can do you know it, it doesn't as i was saying in the opening monologue about that mother Teresa quote that's do it alone you know don't wait for leaders just do yeah. something what are the you always have such good ideas of ways to get involved and ways to be impactful, even in small gestures. Parting thoughts on that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, a couple of things. One, um, I would say if you're partaking in the Super Bowl tomorrow, there's things that you can do. Um, For the Super Bowl specifically, you know, take time, ask everybody to bring a dish. Um, That's a way of volunteering. They can create something. They can bring it. They can be part of it. Don't stretch yourself out by making everything. Um, Also, I I recommend talk about your favorite charities. Um, Maybe put everyone likes to gamble or put a bet on it. Maybe put a jar for um, the two teams, you know, the Eagles and the Patriots. The Patriots. Oh my God, my brain just went dead there. So you're watching Puppy Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> and, and put two jars out and have people put their, their the money in and whatever team wins, it goes to, you know, who's ever leading the charge about that favorite I've charity. seen that at an event before and it was really fun. There was, there was two, let's see, how did it go? It was two different jars and you had to put your money in the jar. You th- they were decorated. So right. it's like, put the money in that jar. And then... I think it was predetermined. Like if yeah. Team A wins, it's going to this charity, the you know Humane Society. If Team B wins, it's going to you know the food bank or whatever. Right, and that could be a fun thing to do. But if you're not into the Super Bowl or you're thinking, Lisa, Amy, get off the Super Bowl, move on. I want to think about how I can volunteer. You know, you can do things like um, visit a shut-in. You know, at this time of year when it's a little bit cold and you're living in a northern climate, there are neighbors who might not be able to get out. My sister fell two weeks ago and broke three bones in her ankle, and so she's shut in. Yeah. And, you know, go visit friends like that or, you know, accompany people who to their chemo sessions or their doctor's appointments or what have you. Obviously, the VA, we talk a lot about the military, you know, go to VA hospitals, call ahead and make sure you know what the requirements are. You can't just show up often on the right. doorstep. Um, obviously, there are children's hospitals here in Chicago, and there's oftentimes activities around children. There's nonprofits or activities with children. I love your friend's idea of cooking for the Ronald McDonald House. That's Absolutely. A great idea. There, there's a way to do that. You know, and for visiting, um, you know, a friend of mine, and, and she wouldn't, I've, I've told this story in the air before, so I, I have her blessing uh, okay. to do so. Um, a friend of mine had breast cancer a few years ago and, and a friend of ours called her and said, I've, uh, you know, I bought this pink ribbon thing that supports breast cancer research, letting you know. And she said, that's great. I'm, I am appreciative that you did that. But you know what I really need? I can't lift the laundry basket. Yeah. Can you come help me with that? That would be huge. Isn't that amazing? And and that's that became their thing. She right. came over once a week and would help her like lift the laundry and do that. Like I got you on that one. And you know, in this time tomorrow, we're expecting a snowstorm here in Chicago. Shovel your neighbor's walk. Don't end at your sidewalk. Yeah. You know, take those extra couple steps. You know, do that. It's going to help your health in more ways than one. I mean, we were just sharing about the benefits of volunteering. That's a volunteer activity. Except for my neighbor who gets mad because he feels emasculated. Oh. And I've done this. <laughs> okay. Well. Well, there's that part. But I the got other, a whole thing going there. But the, you know, there's so many things. Take a meal to somebody who give a couple, maybe.
maybe there's a newborn baby and it's been colicky and the couple is about ready to pull out their hair, the new parents, you know, give them a night off. You know, go and say you'll take care of that baby for a couple hours so that they can have a night off. Make them a meal. Maybe that's a, a de-stressor, you know. Um, we all have had friends. I had a friend um, and she passed away a year ago, January 2nd. Wonderful, wonderful woman. Worked in food banking in Texas. And I couldn't figure out what to do. I mean, my heart broke. And every couple of days, I sent her a card. Every couple of days, I have blank note cards. And I just, I would just talk nonsense, it seemed to me, about my life. Hi, how are you? This is what I'm doing. Is someone in Chicago again? Oh, I was at the Cubs game. Oh, I was. And her family after told me how much she looked forward to receiving mm. those cards. All of us can put pen to paper. I mean, she couldn't read on the computer. You know, her eyesight was going what? Oh, but all of us can put pen to paper. Buy some blank stationery. Put a note in the card. Be you know, a note in the envelope and send the card and just say, "I'm thinking about you." And then after she passed, I did it for a while for her daughter and her husband, so that it wasn't like, "Okay, she's gone. I forgot about you." There are so. Is that volunteering? I think it is. Is that philanthropy helping your fellow man? Absolutely. All of us can do something. We can smile. We can pay for the coffee for the person behind us. You're get, stopping and getting a coffee. Ask your colleague if they want a coffee. Text them. Pick up a lunch for everybody at the office. All of that helps people be better in their day because you did something kind for them. Fair enough. So in summation, be cool. Be cool. <laughs> be we cool. all can be cool. Be nice. Look out be for not, people. And, you know, we're waving to people here. I have to close. I had an Uncle Isidore Aloysius Vicarious, a very wow. Polish man. <laughs> Uncle Isidore. And Uncle Isidore always waved to people because he, I don't know, he had this truck on the country road. And I'd say, do you know him, Uncle Isidore? And sometimes he did and sometimes he didn't. But. I read. I bumped in when I was kayaking on the river with a friend um, to this young man, and he was telling me his life story. And when he found out he did philanthropy, he goes, oh, my God. He said, my friend Billy says, my roommate Billy, he was his roommate, said, I can't afford to give money, but every day I wave at somebody, I smile at someone, or I say hi, because he had read somewhere that the number one reason people who are contemplating suicide don't do it is because somebody smiled at them, somebody said hi, somebody acknowledged them. He said, do you think Billy's making a difference, Lisa? And I said, choking back tears, I said, yeah, Billy's making a difference. All of us can smile, say hi to somebody, acknowledge somebody. That homeless man in the street, the homeless woman, the distressed out parent in the grocery store to help make this world a little bit better. And to me, that's volunteering and philanthropy. Well said. Thanks so much for being with us, Lisa. I uh, love being here. Always a pleasure.